Okay. So um, our last uh, speaker today, uh, before our um, discussion panel, is um, Heather Rolf. Um, Heather did her Bachelor in Applied Psychology, Master's in Social and Applied Psychology, and PhD, um, all in the School of Psychology at the University of Kent here um, in the UK, United Kingdom. She then became a lecturer for a year. Um, since that contract expired, she has been writing papers on various um, interactions between music, identity, and emotion. Um, and this is a short sentence she mentioned. Um, to be honest, I was hoping to do a bit of networking at this conference to help on the job hunting, but mm -hmm. instead I'll have to let my work talk for myself. I totally agree that um, the in-person and normal physical conferences uh, have that um, advantage of networking and getting to know people um, by their uh, face and being able to physically talk with people. Um, but um, this is the situation now. So without any further ado, um, I'll let her presentation talk for itself. Thanks a lot, Heather. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Yes. See if I can bring it up full screen. Okay, excellent. So, thank you very much uh, both for that lead in and to everyone who's spoken so far. There are some really tough acts to follow, but I've really enjoyed everything I've heard. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Roger Gina Sorolla, who is my supervisor who helped me with this project and who also let me practice this talk at him when I panicked earlier in the week. So today I would like to talk to you guys about the emotions of anger and disgust in response to controversial music types. See, for as long as there's been music, there has been people who want to condemn said music. Normally they reserve themselves to things along the lines of, what is this garbage and why would anyone listen to it? Sometimes, however, there comes a piece of music which is so heavily disliked for being so controversial that people dip into language associated with the emotions of anger and disgust. Uh, the rapper Eminem recently very helpfully dropped an example of exactly this a few months back. He decided to rap about the events of the Manchester Arena bombing. Obviously a horrifying event, not something to be taken lightly, and yet he took it lightly and decided to rap about it. When people wrote about him in the media, they promptly started referring to him as disgusting, these lyrics make me feel sick, all that sort of condemnation. But the use of anger and disgust themed language is slightly out of step with what social psychology would su suggest about what elicits anger and disgust. See, normally anger and disgust are kind of considered to respond to concepts such as direct physical harm, uh, potential for biological contamination and such. Obviously music isn't physically violent towards you, it doesn't run the risk of getting you sick. So that actually provides us a really unique place where we can start exploring how these things do interact with each other uh, so we can look at anger and disgust when they lack their physical components. So something I rapidly found out when I became a PhD student is that apparently there's a lot of literature about the emotions of anger and disgust. So given I've got such a short time, I've loosely clustered the ideas about moral anger and disgust into three separate categories for you. The first of which is some research suggests that anger may be specifically elicited by perceptions of harm. Uh, discussed by norm-breaking behaviours regarding sexuality, body functions, and body modification. Essentially, if it's likely to cause pain, it might cause anger. If it's likely to get you sick, it might cause disgust. Alternatively, some research suggests that the elicitation of anger or disgust might vary depending on what is being targeted. So, someone who accidentally hurts another person, their actions might make you angry. Someone's in pain, it wasn't anyone's fault, but you're still going to feel angry about it. Meanwhile, someone who never hurts another person, but who clearly wants to, one of those sort of creepy people that sits around thinking about hurting other people, that would elicit disgust, a real sense of discomfort towards that person's moral character. And finally, there is also this idea that whether or not you choose, to, well, whether or not you feel anger or disgust may actually be elicited by to what extent the events are relevant to you as a person. Something which hurts you as a person, but you have to admit doesn't really bother anyone else, it might cause sort of a more personal anger. So when you're hurt, when someone's nasty to you, maybe they 
Maybe that might cause anger, but something that's clearly damaging society, that might elicit disgust. So there is a lot of different content that can potentially elicit these, immoral, these moral emotions of anger and disgust. Not everything that elicits the two emotions is necessarily moralized. We were open to the fact that there's a lot of forms of non-moral anger and disgust as well. For example, obviously memory is very emotional. Uh, so whenever you re-experience these memories of being angered, a memory of being disgusted, you re-experience the anger or disgust you felt on that day. So hypothetically, if music became associated with an anger or disgust inducing memory, you may well feel that anger and disgust again upon hearing the song. And of course, some people do use different emotions, including anger and disgust. Uh, sometimes people have these specific self-regulatory goals in regards to these emotions. So some people might listen to very angry sounding music to process that anger. Some people might listen to intentionally discordant music in order to make themselves feel uncomfortable. So throughout this work, we were really open to the idea that both anger and disgust could potentially have both moral and non-moral components to it. Something we were also really interested in was this idea of what happens next? If you feel anger or disgust, what do you then do about it? Uh, there's a massive amount of literature about the behavioral consequences of these emotions. So to very briefly summarize, there is some evidence that anger may be an approach emotion. So if you feel angry, approach a situation in order to change it. Disgust is slightly more of an avoidance emotion. Uh, when you see something disgusting on the ground, for example, you would step around it. And so taking all of the different literature into account, we came up with three competing hypotheses. The first of which was the both moral hypothesis. This was based on the literature suggesting that anger would respond to perceived harm, injustice, references to such within the music. Uh, disgust would refer to any sort of references to bodily abnormality, impurity, uh, deviant sexual behavior contained within the music's lyrics, for example, because both anger and disgust would respond to moral components, we named this the both moral hypothesis. Alternatively, anger might respond to self-relevant situations, uh, personally harmful music, um, and disgust could potentially refer to any sort of general immorality within that music, and because anger would be personal, disgust, moral, we named it the disgust moral hypothesis. And finally, we had sort of the corresponding anger moral hypothesis, where disgust could be potentially some sort of backseat aesthetic enjoyment of some sort of discordant sounds in the music, and anger would take on the moral role against different types of harm within that music. So we started out super exploratory. We got ourselves a set of MTurk participants, a set of psychology undergraduates. We asked them to think about a time that music had made them feel angry in one condition or disgusted in a different condition, uh, and just write about a, a short paragraph about why you felt that way. In the second study, we also felt a lot more confident with the literature, so we got ourselves a whole bunch of different items from different pieces of literature built them into a quantitative scale in order to determine what factors underlie disgust and anger at music. So these are actually the first studies I ran as a brand new PhD student. I was very much afraid I was going to get nothing of interest. My participants did not let me down. I got some really interesting comments about music and the people making it being evil outright. Uh, I got a lot of discussion about prepackaged crap with no soul or meaning. An impressive amount of comments about when I was a child, this actually meant something. Uh, and also concerns about potential dumbing down of the next generation. So obviously I had plenty to work with. Uh, what we did was we started by coding our qualitative responses. Uh, we sent it out to two different coders. They had decent amount of agreement. Uh, we asked them to pull out sort of what things were coming up repeatedly in the disgust and anger conditions. First thing we found was that between the two conditions, a lot of mentions were made of aesthetics, music which just sounds terrible. This was equally likely to be mentioned in both the anger and disgust condition with no significant difference between them. Apparently, if you feel negatively about music, there's a strong chance you just don't like how it sounds. What was an interesting difference between disgust and anger was a lot of conversation about immoral content. A lot of people, when we asked them to write about disgusting music, not anger inducing music, these disgust writing people were talking about things like immorality, uh, deviant sexuality, references to violence, incredibly profane lyrics. There was also a lot of concerns about harm to social groups. 
So a lot of people generated responses saying, I don't like this because it's sexist, because it's racist. And these were very much more strongly endorsed in people who wrote about disgust versus those who wrote about anger. Uniquely to the second study, we did have a connection between anger and personal harm. So people asked to write about anger mentioned negative experiences associated with the music, for example, being broken up with while that song played, uh, and emotional regulation goals. These were much more common in the anger condition as opposed to the disgust condition. Uh, when we analysed our quantitative measures, we found five underlying factors. The first being immoral content, uh, the second being implications of moral character in regards to the people who learn that music, the music being a bad example of its genre or of the artist's work, were also, that was also a factor. The music being personally important in some way to the respondent was also mentioned a lot. Uh, after all, if someone decides to release a very bad version of something that you like a lot, then obviously that's going to be a problem for you. And finally, there was also the self-relevant harm, the personal concerns, etc. And finally, we decided to run a difference between to what extent do these factors come out differently in the disgust and anger conditions. Uh, we found some really good responses here because the immoral content and the immoral character factors were both much more strongly endorsed in the disgust condition and the personal importance factors were both rated higher in the anger condition. And what this means is that across both qualitative and quantitative responses across two different sample sizes in two different studies, we found really great responses basically supporting the discussed moral hypothesis. This idea that anger responds to self-relevant harm discussed to all forms of immorality. And so for the next half of our research, we flipped the script. Uh, we started by prompting people with different types of content. Uh, and decided to measure how they felt about it and what they do about it. So we took five factors loosely based off of our last study. We asked participants to think of a type of music that contained immoral content, implications of immoral character, that was a bad example of its type, uh, that had previous negative experiences associated with it, and also had bad aesthetics in acknowledgement of the fact a lot of people mentioned it over the previous two studies. In response to this, we measured anger and disgust, on the same grid to allow participants to tease apart these feelings because sometimes they can co-vary with each other. We hoped that this would help participants understand which way they were feeling about what. We measured approach tendencies, which we defined as someone being willing to move into the space of the music in order to engage with it more, get rid of it. Think someone who spends their time sharing things on Facebook, get rid of this music. Someone who signs a petition against it, who supports a ban against it. Avoidance tendencies, we said, were just instantaneous, remove it from my space and forget about it, type of behaviours. Think switching off a radio or leaving a room where it's playing. We also measured moral contagion fears and reputational concerns associated with music on the grounds that disgust can sometimes have contaminating issues with it. Once again, we had really strong correlations, sorry, we had a really strong association between immoral content and disgust. Immoral content, implications of immoral character and aesthetics prompted significantly more disgust than anger, even when the two emotions are measured together. These same content also elicited significantly more reputational concerns. So the music, which is seen as disgusting, has immoral content, bad aesthetics, and is seen as contaminating in some way. Uh, then we measured behavioral consequences in response to these things. Uh, obviously, avoidance tendencies in this middle chart we're going to be stronger than approach throughout. We generally prefer to avoid stuff we don't like. However, when we measured hostile approach, so supporting a ban, supporting petitions, there was a very, there was a significant difference between all of the stuff with immoral content and all of the non-moral content. If something is immoral, people were more likely to say, yes, I would act against it, leading us to what we referred to as the cleansing hypothesis. If you see a physical disgusting mess and it's on your body or your car, you don't just leave it there, uh, you want to get rid of it before it spreads to everything else and makes everything else gross. Same idea, but with immoral, immoral content in music. If this content is out there and you see it as contaminating, of course you want to get rid of it. Otherwise, it'll contaminate a lot more people and those immoral ideas might spread. So obviously, we didn't want to just say it and leave it. So we ran a quick follow-up study where once again, we gathered some undergraduate participants, prompted them with content types, uh, collapsed a couple of the different factors, 
Uh, so we just measured general immoral content, general aesthetics, association with negative experiences, uh, and because of the other research we were running at the time, added a factor for disliked people. We measured disgust, anger, approach, avoidance and response, and also asked participants, if you could change this music, how would you do so? Again, a strong connection between disgust and immoral content, and again, aesthetics. As before, everyone wanted to avoid the stuff they hated, but were more likely to approach it in the immoral content condition. Across all the content types, the most desired change was the style, which makes sense because a lot of cultural stuff is kept within the style of music. However, for immoral content, the lyrics were equally required to change. For example, if you've decided to rap about a terrorist attack, changing the lyrics to remove that reference would, unsurprisingly, remove that immoral content. So a very quick tour of what I did on, as part of my PhD. What did we find overall? that evidence supports the disgust moral hypothesis. If someone is saying this music is disgusting, they are probably targeting perceived immorality regardless of the kind of that immorality. There is some weak evidence for a connection between anger and self-relevant harm. Uh, this depended strongly on sample. Some people seemed to endorse it, others did not. Music labeled as disgusting can be seen as leading to moral contagion and the tendency to stain one's character by association. Uh, it can trigger the desire to approach the music to change it, to stop that immorality from spreading. And there is a small consistent pattern of non-moral aesthetic disgust. So if it sounds bad, it elicits disgust without the corresponding approach tendency. Why, do, why does any of this matter? Well, it begins by putting down an interesting empirical study about how anger, disgust, and music can interact in the context of various aspects of social psychology. More importantly, we can learn stuff about both concepts from each other. By looking into research about emotion, we can learn some cool stuff about music. For example, by understanding why people are distressed by immoral music, we can open the floor to discussion between fans of controversial music and critics of that same music. And finally, by using music as a research tool, we get to shed some really interesting light on current theories of emotion. I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that anger is seen as an approach emotion, disgust avoidance, in our case, we found a connection between disgust and approach, but only under a specific moralized circumstance. That provides us some interesting stuff to look at. I have lots of future ongoing research. Uh, I've just realized I've run out of time. So if you're interested, I'm happy to be asked about it. But I do have a sequel piece coming up where we look at why people forgive immoral music in order to enjoy it. Thank you for your attention. Please feel free to get in contact. I've deliberately left my email address so you can. And I guess this is the point where I open up for questions. Thank you very much, Heather. That was very, very interesting. Um, it's not very often research looks into the negative uh, emotional impacts of music, so it was quite interesting to get that kind of portrayal of it. Um, so we have um, a couple of questions. Uh, a couple of people have asked about the influence of lyrics and that whether can music be perceived as so immoral and so disgusting and angry inducing um, if there, there's not those lyrics there that portray those kind of themes of immoralness? I think the most obvious example that's coming straight to my head is the idea of playing like a karaoke version or an instrumental version of a controversial song. Uh, when I started this work, the piece we always talked about was Blurred Lines, which for the three people in the world lucky enough to have not heard this song, was a song that basically suggested, by the way, women secretly want to be assaulted. Obviously, that is an incredibly disgusting idea. I think if a karaoke version or an instrumental version was playing in the background, it might be seen as almost implicit endorsement or like a sneaky endorsement of what's actually in the lyrics. If someone's playing you a karaoke version, it's kind of like they're saying, I'm going to make you listen to this immoral content. You know, it's, you know it's there, but I've hidden it so you can't complain about it. So there could be some ongoing sort of interpersonal negotiations there. Whereas someone who played a cover of it with the immoral content snipped out or you know, outright removed and changed for something much better, that would have the same aesthetics, but might be forgiven. This is what we're hoping to look at next. Yeah, so kind of um, adding to that question, we've had um, a couple of questions asking whether you know or you're thinking of investigating specific musical features um, like loudness, etc., and whether that can um, relate to these like feelings of disgust and anger as well. 
There is some research that connects sort of disgust and anger to uh, sounds in music. Obviously, I didn't have time to cover all of the literature I'd like to, but there is some early evidence, I think, in a couple of papers that discordant sounds or sort of loud jarring sounds, things like noise music, can induce anger and disgust in listeners. Um, obviously, I would absolutely love to study that. It depends on if I can find funding, someone to work with me, etc. But yes, I'm open minded to that sort of thing. Right. Um, so we've had a couple about as well, um, kind of the individual differences, and you kind of alluded to this, um, obviously preference is going to have a huge um, impact because some people might have really liked the Blurred Line songs despite the fact of its immoral content. Um, how does that feed into it, like music preference, do you think? Music preference obviously has a really strong impact on how we interact with our music listening. Uh, one of the pieces I didn't get to talk about in my current research is how someone's interaction with controversial music, uh, we used heavy metal and hip hop. Uh, if it's a strong part of their identity, then they see it as worth protecting and maybe would react strongly against people who thought it was immoral. So to what extent you use music to enjoy yourself, to what extent it's part of your personal identity. All of these things can really heavily interact with each other in regards to how you might approach it. So yeah, there's lots of different ongoing strings of research which I'm trying to bring together here. Yeah, I think that's the nature of studying anything um, musical based or art based. There's loads of different things that you have to take into account. Um, we've had a couple of questions about um, yes, music can evoke anger, but sometimes people actually use it for that specific purpose and find that positive and are kind of the cathartic use of music, especially um, in heavy metal users, they often report using it for that purpose of inducing that anger because they want to experience it. I think you did allude to this as well, but can you elaborate on any of that? Deliberate use of music to induce things like anger has definitely been found, uh, especially in previous literature, they'll say people listen to it as sort of a catharsis uh, method of processing anger. We did have some references to this in our qualitative responses. When we asked people sort of what music makes you angry, we did have a small percentage who said, it makes me angry, but that's on purpose. I want to feel angry, I want to process my anger. This was dwarfed by the sort of other personal responses, but it was there to some extent. Uh, just talking entirely off my head, I'd say there might be a rule of language use there. Uh, I, I did notice some people say, I might say that it makes me feel angry, but what I actually feel is pumped up or excited or something. So some people might feel anger, use music to elicit anger to process it, but refer to it as carthesis or being pumped up or being excited. So we'd have to kind of address both positive and negative wording for anger. Yeah. Um... So we've had um, a couple of questions as well about um, specifically the use of foul language in lyrics. Um, we, it's arguably that as uh, in modern music, the use of foul language has become increasingly more popular and therefore is a kind of an element to desensitization to this. And do you think you might see differences in between what people find disgusting in this kind of foul language uh, representation between younger and older adults who've grown up with different kinds of music, as Andrea said in our earlier talks. Yeah, I think if I had all the time in the world, I'd love to go back and like sort all of my qualitative responses by age, because I think there's definitely a marked difference there. I did notice uh, just anecdotally when I was reading through my data, a lot of people who were complaining about sort of disgusting lyrics, how dare they swear, they make reference to sort of body parts and things. A lot of them then went on to say, I'm worried about my children hearing it, implying that they were at least a certain age. Whereas a lot of my younger participants, when they mentioned bad language, it was more likely to be in reference to sort of group interactions. So they might not be offended by a four letter word, but a word that was derogating women would be equally offensive to them. So profane language is different, I think, by generation. So different words would elicit the same response. That's really interesting. Um, on a kind of like similar level, uh, we have one here about cultural differences and whether the cultural context might impact your results as well. So obviously countries with a higher tolerance and more relaxed about certain things for uh, swearing, um, might have a different response in their level of anger to, and disgust to music than other countries who might not have that level of um, tolerance. 
Yeah, there's definitely a lot of research that suggests that morality in general is strongly different between countries, especially between sort of the Western Hemisphere and elsewhere. So already you're dealing with sort of moral components that might not necessarily generalise and then how people choose to express it. So some people might be comfortable expressing things behind closed doors, but expect it to not appear in their music. Some people might be the opposite. Uh, you've actually hit on something there, which is a pet cause of mine. I'm desperate to run these studies internationally, cross-culturally, etc. Uh, this is the burden of being a brand new graduated grad student, is that I have all of these ideas and I want to run all my stuff cross-culturally. I'm just waiting for the opportunity to show up at some point. Yeah, I understand the feeling. Um, so um, there's an interesting question here about how sometimes when you first listen to a piece of music you can get a sense of pleasure but then when you've listened to it so many times and it's repeated and repeated it can actually change to a feeling of like anger and do you have any kind of like understanding of um opinions on that um well first and foremost i completely get where you're coming from that happened to me last week i listened to a song like once and it was in my head four days later i definitely was not impressed by that most obvious thing that comes to mind in terms of literature is this idea of intrusiveness. So we really don't like things that are forced on us against our will. And so while you may have consented to that first listen of the music, when it's still in your head four days later and you know you've got no one to blame but yourself, uh, that is incredibly frustrating. It's intrusive. It might even be interfering with what you're trying to do. Uh, so naturally that's going to elicit anger. So that may well be connected to the intrusiveness literature. That's really interesting. So um, kind of similar to some of the questions we've already had as well. Um, do you think social context of where this, the music's often heard will have an impact? For example, something like Blurred Lines is probably often played in a clubbing context where obviously um, choir singing is going to be more heard in a church context. Do you think that would, the how often and where the music is often heard will have um, evoke different responses and um, levels of anger and disgust? Yeah, social context is going to be absolutely huge. I think music, I, in an, I think music is very much a way by which we express certain norms, certain opinions, etc. And it doesn't get excused all the time from the same rules as just talking. If someone stood on a bucket in the middle of like, uh, restaurant or a grocery store and started talking about explicit sexual content, we'd be horrified and probably disgusted to use the appropriate terminology. So we wouldn't expect to hear music with that content being piped over while we buy groceries. On the other hand, someone who walks into a nightclub and is offended by sort of just the use of a single four letter word, they would probably not be given as much sympathy. So I think it's held roughly to the same standards as just general speech with a small caveat that sometimes we don't actually realize what we're listening to. The number of people I've heard say, I really love this song, but the other day I listened to the lyrics and I had no idea what I've been singing this whole time. So there's almost this little bit of per permissiveness until we catch on. So yeah, social context is incredibly important. I think it's very similar to speech and other expressions of ideas. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, point there. And now, once you said that, it kind of clicked in my mind that it would relate to that and how speech works as well. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So we have a question about whether who creates the music might have an impact in the sense you mentioned um, earlier about um, kind of having as if you have a strong identity or, or a strongly connected to the music you're going to want to protect it it could also maybe translate to who creates the music in the sense that a lot of rappers um, tend to use words that other groups might not use uh, especially outside of that context but it seems to be accepted and enjoyed in the context of rap music yes the identity both personal and group based of whoever makes the music does have some impact on how we react to that music so someone who is speaking for sort of a disadvantaged group would find that disadvantaged group very strongly willing to defend them from certain things, not everything, but from some things. Uh, but the inverse is also true, where a perfectly, per like a perfectly harmless piece of music or content, if whoever's made it has committed sort of a foul act in their personal life, that music often then gets condemned by proxy. You've often seen someone saying this person's been arrested for sort of paedophilia or sexual harassment or whatever. Everyone throw out your albums that they made. So the identity of the artist is almost as important as the identity of the listener. 
as well as the content itself. It all kind of overlaps. Okay, I think we've run out of time, but thank you very much, Heather. That was really interesting and some really good answers to the questions then. Um, uh, great end to the day, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I hope this stops sharing appropriately. Thank you. <laughs>